audio and video conference without a physically present quorum of the Rock Island City Council due to the disaster declaration issued by Governor Pritzker. Because of this order related to COVID-19 health concerns affecting the state and the city, the mayor has determined that an in-person meeting at City Hall with all participants may not be practical or prudent. All the persons and staff may not all be physically present at City Hall due to the disaster and physical attendance may be limited. To participate remotely during the public comment or public hearing portion of this meeting, please join by phone at 1-267-553-4292, pin 439 400 pound. Thank you very much. Roll call. Alderperson Robinson. Hurt. Here. Gilbert. Present. Swanson. Here. Parker. Here. Poulos. Here. Healy. Here. And Mayor Tomes. Here. All right. Public comment. Anybody sign up for public comment? Must be. Yeah, one. We'll let him go now. All right. Tom Tom signed up to speak. <laughs> I was going to ignore it, but. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, and thank you for allowing me to speak this evening. Um, first, I'd start out by thanking you all for raising my taxes and uh, approving the SSA. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to uh, uh, watching that project evolve. Um, I am a resident of Rock Island, live in the district, and I also own a boat down at Sunset Marina. And if, if my understanding is correct, part of this evening we'll be talking about the future of the marina as it moves forward. And you have the uh, difficult task of figuring out how that's going to happen. Now, understanding that I am a CPA by trade and usually use some power of persuasion using numbers. But this evening, I'd like to share a story. And so this isn't really natural, so please indulge my story as I move forward. I've grown up since age 12, um, spending countless weekends down at Sunset Marina as a, as, as a child, um, exploiting the blessings that we call Sunset. And then 48 years later, I'm still cherishing my time down there as I currently have a boat slipped there. The only difference between then and now is I'm paying the bills now. <laughs> um, but it was a childhood that exposed me to many parts of nature that I would never have been exposed to. That showed me that the river is hours of pleasure interrupted by moments of panic, teaching me that the power of the mighty Mississippi is to be respected, and at the same time, indulging in the simple pleasures of dropping breadcrumbs into the water to see which fish might come nibble on them. A childhood that created hours of forced family fun. As we packed up the car with the things needed for the weekend's activities, never really appreciating at that moment how it was binding my family together in ways that I would not have otherwise experienced. In my teenage years, unexpectedly watching my parents form lifelong friendships with their peers, now truly realizing the blessing that that gave them. As a parent, taking those traditions of forced family fun and imposing them on my children, who have now have memories as vivid as mine. They have lifelong friends from there. They have lifelong skills they've learned through that place that's very special. And we have many, many stories to share amongst us that were full of laughters and smiles, even today now as a grandparent, watching my grandchildren and their friends file on board like little ducks, begging for when we can go and anchor in Lake Potter, wanting to swim, float, and jump off the back. The thousands of laughs, screams, 
and the little ones standing on the back deck, shivering after hours of being in the water, asking for a towel to dry off. None of that I would trade for the world. And as a friend sharing an experience with many that would never have had had such a great experience in one of the favorite places in, in my world, a world called Sunset. Dozens of people each year I'm throughout the Quad Cities and in some cases from around the country have joined me in boarding the ship in Sunset and be able to experience things they've never experienced before. No one ever left the waters of, from Rock Island Sunset without a heartfelt thanks for sharing a unique experience, again, from a place we call Sunset. Now, as a bo boat owner, I also think about the thousands of dollars I've spent with many of the business owners all around, whether it be Ted's Boatorama or with Mr. Unley, from buying a bag of ice to new life jackets for my grandchildren to winterizing my boat every year. Not consciously thinking about how that supports our community, but knowing that it is supporting the people all around that marina and within our city. And that it adds to some of the sales tax dollars that are so limited within the city boundaries. But I am only one story, but it can be multiplied a thousand times, if not more, by the 200 plus boaters that currently utilize and dock their boat there, a majority of which I believe are from outside the city of Rock Island. And by the hundreds of boaters that lower their, their boats into Potter's Lake for a day of skiing or fishing or just floating. Families, friends, with, their, with all the memories that they will create. Then there's the thousands of kayakers who paddle their way just to Sunset Marina so that they can join the Floydzilla and experience what some of us may not be able to see as often as I have had been privileged to. And then there's the thousands of bikers that end their route right at the marina, simply to watch the activity within the marina, to rest and ponder one of our great gems within the city. So I guess I have to close with some numbers. Millions of memories, tens of thousands of family and friends that bind together, hundreds of thousands of economic dollars that are brought into the city, some in the form of sales tax. Thousands of tourists that visit our great city solely because Sunset exists. Hundreds of lessons learned and one story. Thank you. Thank you. And that's the only one signed up here. Is anybody virtual for public comment? Hearing none. Mr. Bartels, you're up. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Um, tonight we're going to talk about the marina market analysis that was performed by Edgewater Resources. We have uh, two representatives from Edgewater on the call today. Uh, Greg Weigamp, who's a president with Edgewater Resources, and Nick Stefani, who is one of their project engineers who have been involved with the marina. Um, as you know, uh, in, uh, in September of 2022, we came, I came to council and we asked for permission to go out for RFQs and negotiate a contract with Edgewater Resources and IMA consultants for the electrical work and the um, design for the dock. And uh, in, in doing that, um, and, and through that contract negotiation, um, the need came up that it is a requirement that dredging would be needed to install the 400 dock. And the cost associated with the 400 dock made us 
have to step back and come back to council again back in October. Um, and, and stepping back during that September council meeting when we asked for permission for the uh, the RFQ process, it was it was mentioned by several council members that they would like to have a market analysis completed on the viability of keeping the marina and before before these dollars are invested in, into the infrastructure that's needed. And so with the issue of dredging being brought up through the contract negotiations and the market analysis study information wanted to be completed, we, we came back to council in October and asked to move forward with this, the analysis, which is why we're here tonight. We have the results of that. So Edgewater is going to be, be presenting those um, results and we'll open it up for questions after or during. Just, just let us know. Um, Edgewater has been doing this for a long time. Uh, they have uh, been involved with lots of marinas all through the United States and uh, uh, outside of the country. So um, they're very, very qualified to present this information. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Greg and Nick. Thanks, Mike. Um, or would you like us to share the presentation from our screen or do you want to share it from yours? I can do either. Um, if you can share it, that'd be fine. Sure. Perfect. All right, before I jump into that, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Greg Wycamp with Edgewater Resources. With me is Nick Stefani as well. Um, I'm a lifelong boater and uh, Edgewater Resources is a company that focuses on marina design, planning operations. Um, we are uh, we've worked on hundreds of marinas and um, we've done feasibility studies for, uh, I've lost count of how many municipal operations similar to this uh, with this exact same question is how do you run a facility like this? What, what are the finances? What should they be for an operation like this? What would it cost to bring a facility up to uh, the proper codes and standards? And I'm going to walk through that process for you. Um, and most importantly, of course, um, is, you know, is this a, is this a financially viable operation? Uh, and in that context, um, how would we put that together? So I'm gonna hit share screen here and hopefully you will shortly see my presentation. Can you see the, uh, the aerial photo of your facility there? Mm -hmm. Yes. Excellent, thank you. Okay, this, uh, we were out there, were out there a few months ago um, looking at the facility and uh, the, the process, we actually have two tasks. Uh, this is the marina, uh, market analysis task, and it really includes quite a bit of, of uh, financial analysis. We started with a condition assessment, and then we did, in, in parallel with that, as a market analysis. And then we did, looked at alternative strategies for how would you, what would you do with this facility, and then funding strategies for how to put it together and move forward. So what you can see here, I'm not going to belabor the condition assessment too much, but you, you definitely have a facility that is uh, primarily well past its, its useful lifespan. Um, just this one image alone here will show you a few issues, the exposed styrofoam flotation. Um, obviously, you've got some, uh, you know, differential uh, flotation there. You've got telescoping spud piles. Um, the, the widths of some of the docks don't comply with ADA. There's a number of, of electrical safety issues. Um, so electrical safety is probably one of the bigger issues that uh, concerns me in terms of liability for everyone. Um, you know, most important, we don't want anyone to get hurt, but um, what electric shock drowning is, if you're not familiar with that, that is when straight current from either a boat or the marina itself, where stray electrical current enters the water. Uh, and if somebody is in the water, that current, if it's about 30 milliamps, which is a very, very small amount, if 30 milliamps of power hits a person, um, they become paralyzed and they drown. It's a, it's a awful thing and you, you've probably heard over the years, oh, somebody drowned in a marina and it was a college swimmer we don't understand and, and that's what causes it. So we have current modern standards for dealing with that. It's not a challenging thing at all to solve um, and any marina we would build would be fully compliant with those codes and also by resolving all ADA issues. Um, every So ADA, you all know about uh, when it was initially implemented in the early 90s, uh, there were not marina standards, uh, there were marina guidelines, and that's an important distinction because when they implemented marina standards in 2010, um, all marinas were supposed to be upgraded to comply back in 2010. Um, that doesn't mean every single dock has to comply, but nothing on this, in this image you see here would be compliant with ADA. And so you have ADA issues as well. And the, and the nice thing with ADA is if, you, if you're ADA compliant, 
you also have a nice safe facility you're not likely to have slips and falls and those sorts of things so just bringing the facility up to modern standards is something we want to get to you can see some of the some of the projects or some of the docks there are, are clearly in rough shape not safe um, you can see we've got uh, water level issues and that the way some of these are binding they're not floating any longer clearly unusable in this condition um, when you look at some of the remnants, this is clearly not something that's particularly attractive. It's more of an attractive nuisance than anything. Um, and, you know, and there's the potential for, you know, materials to come loose, get into the water, become a navigational hazard or, or you know, the kids out there playing and they might fall in the water, or get trapped. So this is stuff that we don't like to see in marinas and our liabilities for you. Um, of course, 400 dock is gone, but the gangway remains. Um, so these are all issues that need to be addressed one way or another. You've got um, a ladder, an escape ladder, which is great, but you have the electrical safety issues. The new electrical standards have something called an electrical datum plane, which requires all connections for electrical to be at least um, two feet, 30 inches above the water and one foot above a floating dock. And so all of these connections that you see in these boxes need to be at least a foot up in the air, and that's usually accommodated inside the pedestal itself. So, and, you know, it's not as if somebody did something wrong, it's just that the codes were entirely different when this facility was built, and um, none of this is currently compliant. Um, many other issues, there's no ground fault protection at the pedestals, there's more connections here that don't have proper covers, we're missing covers and so on here. And this is, you know, this is not uncommon. We see this all the time, in, in every marina that's over 30 years old. This is very common, uh, but it does need to be addressed. And one of the real challenges is if you were to address those electrical issues inside the dock, um, it does require a lot of work to tear the dock apart to get in there. And then of course your dock, the, the expected lifespan of a floating dock is about 25 to 30 years. And these are well past that lifespan. So if you invested in a new electrical system on these docks, uh, you would be wasting a lot of money. So we would not recommend improving the electrical as it exists today. Um, it's definitely a, re a recommendation that it be replaced. Are there any questions on the condition assessment? The short story is, is essentially the facility is past its useful lifespan and needs to be brought up to modern codes. Um, and the most cost effective way to do that at this stage is to, is to basically re rebuild it in phases. So the market analysis process um, included looking at directly at the facilities close in town, but also looking up and up and down the river to get a sense of what's going on in the region. Um, regional occupancy was quite strong with waiting lists at many facilities. Um, there's two, two different kind of levels. You've got only one marina um, in town that's really up to speed and that's uh, Marquee Harbor uh, is up with the current standards. Um, Lindsay Park Yacht Club also charges uh, pretty good rates, uh, but their facilities are not as modern as the Marquee Harbor. Um, your occupancy is well below the region, but I think that's twofold. One, it's the condition of the facility, and two, that many of the slips are 20-foot slips. We generally don't build slips that small any longer. Even the even ski boats these days tend to be 22 to 24 feet long. So we generally encourage you to think, you know, moving towards a larger slip mix, not dramatically larger, but just recognizing that boats over the last 30 to 40 years have generally gotten wider and longer. And so when we dove into this, we looked at, um, there's a whole series of data that's in the report. This is just a summary. But we, we looked at how many slips were in each facility and the different sizes and the breakdowns so we can get a sense of the, 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 you know, what type of market we have. We looked at the average rates. Now these are, average, these are averages. And so for certain slip sizes, they'd be higher or lower. Um, one of the things that is a little bit different about marina slip pricing is typically the larger the slip, the higher the unit price. Meaning unlike everything else, when you go to Costco and you buy in bulk, you pay less per unit. In marinas, we charge 50, you know, we will charge more money per linear foot for a 50 foot slip than we would charge per foot for a 30 foot slip. And so you're actually paying a higher rate to buy more, not just getting more. So um, for occupancy, for what we call seasonal occupancy, that's a boater who's there all summer. Um, we like to target about 95%. Um, for transient occupancy, we target about 50%. From a revenue perspective, 95% seasonal and 50% transient tend to even out. We want to target our operational expenses around 30%, and that, but that is dependent sometimes about the uses. 
So we collect all this information and we propose some rates that are significantly higher than the existing rates, but they are on par with Marquee Marina, which is a nearby facility just upriver. Um, and this is these rates are not particularly high. These rates are very common across the, the this part of the country for this type of, of uh, product offering. So what we want to have is not an extravagant marina. We want to have a code compliant, very durable marina that will be easy to maintain and financially viable. And so Marquis is a good example. And so the rates here would be ranging from 80 to generally 80 to 100 uh, dollars per foot for the sizes you'd primarily be building. And then for transient rates, about a dollar 50 per foot. So these are, like I said, they're on par with what Marquis is charging. They're higher than what you're charging now and they're higher than Lindsay Park, but obviously yours uh, and Lindsay Park are, are much more dated facilities. This also just correlates directly with what it costs to build a facility like this. They're not driven by trying to make a ton of profit. They're driven by this is what that kind of facility costs, what the modern electrical safety standards require has a cost of about $8,000 a slip, for example, for those utilities. And so that's these, these are the rates that correspond also with just the basic cost to build something like this. This is Lindsay Park Yacht Club. It's actually a really interesting looking marina. Um, but this is again, quite dated relative to, to Marquis and it has a number of ADA issues and I was not able to get close enough to look at the electrical, but I would, I would expect to find similar electrical issues um, as you have uh, at sunset. Um, this is a, another modern, more modern facility up in Clinton. Um, again, this is, this is more typical of what you would expect to see um, uh, in a modern facility. Again, these are on, on what we call guide piles. So that allows these docks to float up and down way up to here. You can see how high those guide piles are. They can, they can float up as high as the roof in, in this photo. Um, that is what a modern gangway should feel like. That's a little bit steep actually, but that's at probably close to record low water levels. Um, but if that gangway is 80 feet long, it would be compliant with ADA. Um, this is what you get. Um, this is down at the opposite end of the river. This is down at Bluff Harbor and, and um, this has some of the most unsafe conditions that I think I've ever seen in a marina and I have seen a lot of marinas. Um, <laughs> This is not a gangway I would want anybody to walk on. And, but these folks are charging similar rates to what we're, they're not quite as high, but similar to what we're proposing. And what that tells you is just how much money you can charge for a slip if there's no supply. And so the rates don't always correspond with the quality of the facility. Um, so what we're recommending is to build something very similar on par to what you're seeing here at Clinton and then what you see at Marquis and that these rates tie very closely to the cost of putting something like this together and maintaining operations. And equally important is maintaining long-term financial capacity to keep the marina in this condition. So uh, recognizing I'm a boater myself, I pay slip fees just like every other boater out there. And it is important to avoid the temptation to say this is a publicly owned facility, so we should keep the rates artificially low, where that leads you is it leads you to a place where you don't have sufficient money to maintain the facility to the high level standards that voters expect and need for safety, for, for code compliance and everything else. It's, it's not something about how much money can you wring out of a voter. It's something about what does it cost to provide a facility that the voters desire at the appropriate level of quality, not extravagant, but appropriate, but also maintain sufficient funds to operate it safely and keep it in that condition for the long term. And when you don't do that, you end up in a situation like this. You end up with this kind of thing. It starts to fall apart and you get in a downward spiral and you can't charge more because the facility starts to fall apart. So the strategies for consideration for how to move this forward, this is obviously not an inexpensive uh, undertaking. There's several different facilities or seven, excuse me, several different strategies that we looked at for how would you proceed with this facility? Well. Number one is to continue city ownership and operations much like you are now. And what that would mean would be looking at how do we renovate the facility? How do we bring it up to standards? And then how do we continue operating it 
within the, the similar operational context that you have now. You've got outside third party operators. That's a great strategy um, for them to bring in outside expertise uh, that you might not be able to afford um, otherwise uh, with internal staff. Um, but having that city ownership um, has real advantages in the fact that you don't have the land costs and you don't have the taxes um, that you would have to pay. So you're, you are in definitely in the best financial position to improve the operations and keep them going. Another strategy would be to continue city ownership, but lease the facility to an operator. The same as what you're doing now. You've hired a third party operator to manage it for you. This would be actually leasing out the property to another developer who would come in and make the improvements on your behalf. Um, so what that would mean is somebody else would come in and say, hey, I'm gonna lease this property from you. I'm going to make all the improvements that are proposed and that are needed to make a code compliant facility. And then I'm gonna pay you a certain amount of rent and a certain percentage of the gross revenues over a period of some amount of time. And that's typically about 30 years uh, that when you have an operation like that, it's about a 30 year minimum for an operator to make, uh, make su sufficient returns to make the investment worthwhile. Now, the advantages to that are, of course, that you're not responsible for making all the improvements and you're no longer uh, on the hook for you know, operational losses, for example. Um, but in terms of liability, as the landowner, you would still get dragged into it if, some, uh, if an incident happened. So this is an important thing to consider. Um, and there are some other downsides. Um, there's, there's real positives and negatives. And what it really comes down to is how well the contract is written and how well you align everyone's incentives to do the right thing in terms of long-term maintenance and operation. Uh, the third strategy would be to sell the facility outright, just sell everything to a private developer and have them come in and do what they would like to do. Uh, the challenge with that is you still have all of the same costs to build the facility, but now you have to add to that the land costs. And so that makes it that much less likely or that much less financially viable for another person to come in here and first of all, spend somewhere between $600 and $800,000 to buy the facility. I'll explain where that number comes from in just a minute. And then they're gonna spend $300,000 to demolish what's out there. So they're, they're calling a million dollars in before they've started to spend money on building the new infrastructure. And unfortunately, when you just sell a facility like this, what you tend to get is something like this over time because they just simply don't have the money or what they'll do is they will nurse along whatever infrastructure is there for as long as possible. There is, There are some voters, some percentage of voters that they're not worried at all about the quality of the facility, they're worried about the lowest possible price. And there's nothing wrong with that, except for I wouldn't want you to be in an ownership position of that because you end up with liability issues and safety issues uh, that are very real and probably are not something you wanna deal with. So selling the facility uh, does come with risks. The final option would be closing the facility. Um, we can talk about that, but that would just mean you basically would shut it down. You would invest the $300,000 to take out the infrastructure so that it's not an attractive nuisance. Um, and we'd be displacing 250 voters and losing that economic impact. So um, as we look into these strategies, I'll go through the finances on each one. What we recommend you do uh, first of all, under continuing city ownership, and, and I'll point this out that, that this is my recommendation is that you continue with city ownership because you are in the best financial position to provide the best benefit for the community at the lowest cost. Um, we would recommend not necessarily rebuilding the entire marina. Um, we're currently at, have about 260, 265 renters in a 200 and, or 395 slip facility. Um, we would not recommend rebuilding the whole thing right now. We would plan for a complete reconstruction, but we would recommend, recommend starting at something like 200 slips or maybe even smaller. And, but this model right here shows about 200 slips at a cost of about 9.2 million. Um, I'm not sure why I said size right that, but anyway, uh, when you look at these rates, one of the things you'll notice right off is that the dredging costs are dramatically lower than what was uh, shared with you earlier. Um, one of the things that needs to be done to document and improve these, the accuracy of these estimates is some amount of preliminary engineering. So the original estimate, I believe it was about $5 million for the dredging covered, dredging the entire marina basin, 
at a, at a cost of about 28 or $30 a yard. Uh, we would recommend by, by building a smaller facility and a smaller footprint, again, we're, we're, we're supporting nearly all of the boaters that are there. And I would suspect that out of the 250 boaters that are currently there, maybe 40 or 50 of them would balk at the higher rates and they would go somewhere else. So that's why I chose 200. By cutting the dredge area in half, I automatically lowered it. But then I also looked at the dredge methodology. The rate of about $28 a foot suggests to me mechanical dredging. And um, because it's, it's too high for uh, hydraulic dredging, but not high enough, assuming that the materials are contaminated. So we would need to do some more research to confirm that number. That's probably the biggest wild card number in here. Um, but we would cut the volume in half by, by dredging a smaller footprint. And then I would recommend a hydraulic dredging methodology. And I would suspect that that cost should be closer to about $15 a yard. Um, we, we see um, hydraulic dredging down as low as $8 a yard. So that's one thing. These costs here are different costs for each size slip. Those are direct costs from a manufacturer, recent cost to provide the, the quality of covered dock that we're proposing, the gangways, we build these all the time, the slip utilities, we have a budget of $8,000 per slip. Um, that presumes full water, fire protection, and uh, code compliant electrical. We have some electrical site upgrades and some building renovations. And then we also have a contingency and mobilization to get to about 9.2 million. The, we would then propose to provide the additional capacity to support as many boaters as want to come here, but to build up in smaller phases as necessary. So looking at what that looks like in terms of revenues, um, what we have here is a couple of different things. Um, in the upper left corner, you've got the, the revenue projections. So this is a financial performa, a little static analysis that gives us a sense of just how much could this marina self fund, right? If you're building a facility like this, you're gonna be charging market rates and you're gonna be generating. So we had 50 slips at 25 uh, foot length and we had a rate of $80 per foot. So it was $2,000 a year for that slip and it would generate $100,000 and so on for the various slip sizes. And that equates to about $587,000. We then applied a 95% occupancy to take off the empty slips because we target 95% occupancy, so it's 557. And then we take off 30% for operational expenses, and that leaves us with a net revenue of about $390,000. If you were to use that money to, to um, service a revenue bond at 4% over 30 years, that would be able to that income would be able to support the construction of about $6.75 million. So basically, this is a quick financial performer that says after after the revenue expenses and, and occupancy are taken into consideration, if we were to borrow for a net revenue for, for excuse me, for a revenue bond, we would be able to construct about seven point six point seven five million dollars of construction. Now, I just told you that the facility costs nine point two eight. So we have a shortfall there. So how would we address that? Well, you've got an existing FEMA grant of one point nine million. There's a thing called the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Boating Infrastructure Grant. That is a possibility of a 1.5 million, um, up to that much amount, depending on how many transient boats we want to support. And then $50,000 for a clean vessel at grant to build a new um, uh, pump out, for example. And there's other revenue sources, maybe boat clubs, boat rentals, and other things, um, or just straight up capital expenditures from the city budget. So all of those more than offset the difference between this construction cost and um, the revenue that it could support. We also have up here the summary of the economic impacts. The gentleman who spoke before the meeting talked about the hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's actually much more than that. It's about two and a half million dollars of just off of this facility, the smaller facility. So you see it's total impact across the community is about 14 jobs, about $2.46 million in output. And you know, this is this includes the actual jobs in the marina, but also the money that those folks spend in the community. So basically what we're telling you here is with your existing grant and other grants that we think are likely and the revenues that we think are likely that you would be able to reconstruct this facility and continue to operate it in a reasonably financially self-sufficient way. We looked at a couple of other options and it was suggested that we look at even a smaller size, maybe if it was still the city ownership, what if we looked at 125 slip size versus 200? 
that cost, same exact methodology, that cost is about six and a half million, six point four five seven, and it would generate revenue bond capacity funding of about four point four million. So we have another shortfall of about two million dollars. But again, back to these budgets, you've got a one point nine million dollar FEMA grant, and you've got these other grants. So again, that also is reasonably financially self sufficient. And then we looked at one last strategy, which was just simply rebuilding 400 DOC, which is what you have the FEMA grant for. And so just rebuilding the FEMA, the uh, 400 DOC, I estimate a cost of about 2.57 million, and it would generate in revenue bond capacity about 2.75 million. So this pretty much just with the revenues that it would generate will pay for itself, but you also have the $1.9 million in grant funding. So if you were to apply that $1.9 million, um, you would be uh, quite financially self-sufficient with just rebuilding 400 dock. Now that doesn't address the whole entire marina, but it does address 400 dock. So rebuilding 400 dock at this new standard to kind of prove the point that this is a uh, reasonable for the market, um, in my opinion, is kind of a very straightforward decision. It, even without the grant, it should be financially self-sufficient. So, Looking at some other options, uh, if you were to lease it to an operator, um, generally you would have a lease period of 30 years. So let's say you put it out in a development community, um, please make a proposal to come run and build and own and operate a marina on this site. They would want a lease period of probably 30 or more years. You would still have some liability because whatever happens, you're the landowner. You would have a lower return, obviously because they have uh, higher development costs. And so you're not, you don't have the potential to make as much revenue off of this. There's always the risk of operator default. They could, they could go belly up and disappear. That's not a common thing. Typically to get to the point of making this kind of investment, they've done all their due diligence and they're typically successful, but there's always that risk. And then you would end up inheriting it. And, um, but at that point you wouldn't have built, you wouldn't have invested in the infrastructure. So, um, that would probably work out well in your favor, I guess but it's, it's problematic. If you sell the facility, um, we use something called the, there's a number of different ways appraisers generate value. Now I wanna be clear, we did not do an appraisal. This is not a proper appraisal. What I did do is I looked at the current income that was provided to us um, and applied what's called the um, uh, income uh, valuation approach. And so after looking at the numbers and what a private operator would do, they would, would slice off some of the costs and we'd have about an operate an operational expense of about 130 or excuse me, an operational revenue of about a hundred hundred thousand dollars and then the cap rate the capitalization rate which is a tool that investors would use to see what is that worth and what would they pay for it of about 12 to 15 percent the cap rate for this market is around 10 to 12 percent but there would also be taxes which would add another three to four percent so in this case lower is better and higher is worse and so at the, at the um, higher cap rate, the value of a sale of the facility is going to be around 670,000, maybe up to 835,000. So if you're to just flat out sell the facility, you know, I'm confident the number is going to be between half a million and a million, maybe it could be more just depending on somebody's perspective, but that's roughly what that facility might be worth. You also, if you lose control, you may end up with poor outcomes. Here's some more photos from that other Marina that I, I, you know, you, I've seen some amazing things when people just let marinas go. So not recommended to let that out of your control. Um, of course, just closing the facility, you'd have a $300,000 cost, you'd displace 250 boaters and you would lose all those economic benefits we just talked about. So that is my presentation. My recommendation is to maintain the city ownership, uh, maintain professional third party operations, I would initiate the full renovation of a smaller facility, starting with 400 dock, but maybe more. I would definitely bring the rates up. You need to start bringing the rates up to match the local market, at least for the uh, fully renovated facilities. I will tell you, uh, at some point you have to commit to going the full renovation because there's always some folks who are just gonna, they'll pay the lower rate so long as it's available. Um, and then you expand in phases based on demand and with that, I can go into a little bit more information on grants if you like, or we can stop here and take some questions. I like, can I open up some questions? Absolutely. Um, Greg, thanks for the presentation. Um, one thing I would do want to bring up that wasn't mentioned in here is 
regardless what we do with this, we still have a $283,000 bond debt out there that still exists that's not included in those figures. Okay, yep, we'd have to address that for sure. Yep. Um, so I think before, I would like you to go into the funding, uh, the other grants and things like that, but I, I would like you to answer a question for me, and this has been brought up by some other council that I've discussed this with. Now, I remember in our discussion, you talked about your success with obtaining and helping writing some of these grants. Can you talk about that? Sure. Let me show you some grants and one in particular. Um, go back to this real quick. Can you see the screen again? Yes. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so kind of. the federal grants at play, um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Boating Infrastructure Grant and the Clean Vessel Act Grants are the two that are most relevant to this site. Um, we have had essentially 100% success in both of those programs. I hesitate to say that because that I don't mean to suggest that it's 100% guaranteed that you would get these grants, but so far we've obtained about 20 boating infrastructure grants. Sometimes it's taken two or three bites at the apple to get the grant, but we have managed to always succeed in the end. And what that supports is uh, there's a, what we call a tier one and a tier two grant program. The tier one funds only engineering and planning uh, and the, is, uh, the grant funds are up to $200,000. The tier two is the one we typically go to and it funds, um, excuse me, the tier one is 150,000. Tier two funds up to 1.5 million for both engineering and construction. So how that, that what that funds construction for is transient boating infrastructure. So dedicated transient infrastructure, meaning somebody coming up or down the river from another place. It could be somebody just visiting your facility from another marina in town, or it could be a looper who's coming all the way from who knows where on the East Coast and venturing and exploring up the river. Um, so it funds transit boating infrastructure for slips 26 feet and longer. It's open to public or private entities. And there's a, a, a pretty stringent process for applying for the grant. It's due in September to the feds. How it works is it's actually distributed through state agencies. So the first thing we would do is talk to IDNR and get them on board. We'd actually submit the application to IDNR first. Um, and then once we're all on board with IDNR, then IDNR submits it to Fish and Wildlife Service in September. And then right about this time next year, we would find out if we got the grant. Now, fortunately, um, the, the grant, you have matching funds. The, the amount of funds match is variable. Um, so the way that we've managed to be so successful with these grants is by being very conservative in how we ask for funding. We always recommend that you go over 50% with the match to, because it's a simple point scoring system and you get uh, nearly the maximum points for going to 51% match. And then there's a bunch of other categories that we look at, but primarily this is a great way if you wanted to fund up to a million and a half dollars of construction, that would mean that you're building about $3 million worth of transient infrastructure. Now, that's probably more than you want to do here, but you might be able to get 750 or 800,000 or a million. We've gotten many grants for a million and a half and some as low as four or 500,000. The um, the CVA grant is Clean Vessel Act grant that pays for pump outs, and so that one you pretty much fill out the paperwork and they send you a check. Uh, that one is less competitive, and it is available year round. These other federal grants, FEMA, I think you, you're familiar with some of those. Fisheries and Wildlife, those are available, but those are less commonly used um, for this facility. At the state level. There's often waterways program funding or economic development funding, and it varies by every state. We've, we've typically in Illinois have only been using um, uh, the boating infrastructure grant funds. Sometimes we'll use OSLED grants and other things more for the upland infrastructure, but that would be something we'd have to address with IDNR on the state. And then some of those things that you would get funding for is rethinking that the way your shoreline works. So for example, looking at a soft shoreline versus an armored shoreline. And the reason this would be eligible for funding is because it's habitat creation. We also look at creating access for fishing. Um, you know, we often think that fishing is only a recreational activity and there's a lot of folks who fish subsistence fishing, 
Uh, we are feeding their families. We have ADA compliant kayak access and paddlecraft access. There's a lot of grants out to help support the construction of those types of activities. Currently, there's the Inflation Reduction Act, which if we did some um, renewable energy improvements, there's 30% tax credits for a lot of different strategies there. So there's a lot of different things that we could do. They tend to focus on sustainability and habitat creation and renewable energy. Um, electric boating is a thing that's coming that we could get grant funding to help support some of that as well. So there's a lot of different ways to do it from that perspective on the grant programs. Okay, do questions. May have any questions? I had a boat and I had it in Tuscaloosa, Alabama and Knoxville, Tennessee. Dry docking was very big there. Um, is that an option at all, a cheaper cost or way more expensive? I don't know. Sure. Um, so dry docking, there's a couple of different ways that's done. That sometimes it's, it's called dry storage where the boat lives on a trailer in a parking area or it's in a building which is a dry rack storage, which is a building that looks for all the world like a boat vending machine when you're inside of it. It's basically three or four racks high and it's the boats are stored on racks and lifted into place with a forklift. Uh, the cost of construction for dry storage, just boats on trailers in a parking lot is very, very cheap. Uh, the cost for building a dry rack structure is probably around twenty to $25,000 per slip. So quite reasonable and actually comparable with what it costs to put uh, a wet slip, a covered wet slip in the water. Then you also have the costs of uh, forklifts. You need to have two because 100% guarantee that if you only have one forklift, it will break on 4th of July morning. <laughs> um, Murphy loves marinas. Um, so typically people buy one used forklift and one new forklift and then they kind of cycle over the years. Um, it could entirely be possible. It's a, it's a good strategy. It can provide a lower cost option, particularly if uh, I don't have clear numbers on how many 20 foot boats were in some of those slips. But if that was a significant portion of our of our of our occupancy, then that would be the perfect boat to put in a rack building. And from a boater perspective, it's wonderful because you don't even have to think about it. The boat is cared for. It's put away. You don't have to find winter storage for it. And then you can use the aisleway in between as as winter in indoor covered storage in the winter as well, heated storage. So uh, that is not something I took a deep look into, but it, it, from the finances, the cost per slip is comparable to the cost of the smaller slips in my model. So that would actually probably make just as much sense. Thank you. I'd like, I'd like Mike to talk a little bit more about the 400 dock and the FEMA grant and kind of where we stand and where we need to go with that, if you would. Yeah, so we, we received the funding, or we haven't received any funding. Any funding we do receive, the city has to pay for that all up front and then being reimbursed after the project is complete. So based off of actual cost. And there's, a, there's an inspection process and, and you know, document closeout um, for that project as there would be with any federal project. Um, but the 400 dock and then the associated dredging needed has a, a, a timeline to be completed by. We have been extending that, you know, by six month time frames, I believe, um, since that, since we enacted the grant or approved the grant. So um, the current deadline for that is September 30th of 2023. We did reach out to FEMA um, ahead of this meeting and explain the need for dredging that was brought aware um, by Edgewater for the 400 dock and they had said that that would be a, a reasonable um, justification for an extension of the grant. Um, but we can't apply for that extension until our current deadline is up. So we wouldn't even be able to submit for an extension until August of this year. Um, but we do have that in an email um, you know, response back from FEMA say, saying that it would qualify for the extension and we would, we would do an extension from that September 30th date, and we we would do at least a year extension from that time frame, and they were they were agreeable to that. So um, it can be extended, but we are, and I'll let Edgewater would know more. But I mean, these things take time. Just getting the, a, a dredge plan and the work ahead of that for permitting, and the surveying that's required. I mean, it, it's 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 for EPA, and you know through the contaminations. It takes a long time to get this work done. So the sooner we could have a, a recommendation or direction from the council, the better. 
um, any recommendation. It doesn't have to be moving forward with, with the improvements. It could be looking at lease options or going, um, looking at closing the facility. We just need some direction. But the immediate, the immediate thing we have to address, we need to get back with FEMA and, and look at saying yes or no on the 400 dock. And again, the dredging is tied to that 400 dock. And uh, if we're going to do dredging, we have to do dredging around the existing, some of the existing docks and the area to the boat area where we pull the boats out. In, in, in low water like we had last year and like we expect usually every year, every year um, it's just not, there's not enough water there to, to get your boat around safely and out to the, the Mississippi River. Um, I was out in a boat in 2021 and there, we were doing some probing and there was like two or three feet of water. It was just, I don't, I don't know how anybody with a boat of size could, could navigate the, uh, the marina and get out to the river. So dredging needs done. We know we, we provided some preliminary numbers. Again, everything that we're talking about tonight is estimates because no engineering work has been completed um, and, and really no scope has been defined. So. Um, until we know a scope of how we want to move forward, whether it's 400 dock alone, no docks, and, and just decommissioning, we just need to have a general direction on, on and consensus among the council on how to move forward. We talk about 400 dock, but that all the FEMA deal it also includes electrical, correct? Th that's correct. However, you know, hearing Edgewater talk tonight and in previous conversations with them, that electrical that was included in the FEMA grant was for other docks that we may be wanting to decommission. So we would need to go back to FEMA and say, we need to revise our scope and we're only going to do electrical on 100 and 300, you know, on the docks that we want to keep that we feel could be extended as far as, you know, amount of years left on the useful life um, and only doing that electrical. So again, th these are just estimates, a, a, a scope would have to come back and what we would do um, based on what council's direction is, is work with Edgewater to come up with and not just as water, but F3 and, and city staff and coming up with a plan on, on what really needs to be done, what we think would be the best option and, and the boaters. So um, that, that alone will take some time too, but we would come back with the proposal on, on what it would cost to have that design done and then a recommendation and obviously there would be an approval process. We, we are familiar with the, uh, the big P, the big boating infrastructure grant that was utilized for Schwebert docks um, and have, we received one and a half million dollar grant that Greg was mentioning before. So we have, we have been successful in those. Um, the Clean Vessel Act, we never really looked into those, but uh, we, we, you know, we could apply for grants for, for funding as mentioned. The council had previously uh, designated a million dollars of ARPA funding to go toward a match for the FEMA grant. That, that money plus the FEMA grant would still leave some gap depending on the cost of dredging, right? Yeah. What, that's what, that. What's that estimated to be, 500 to a, a million? In for dredging? For over the, what would the total cost of the project be including dredging Depends minus on how the grant? The dredge we did, minus the ARPA. Yeah, but just a range. Get 400 dock done. Dredging to get 400? Mm -hmm. So it lift well. In, in the plan for the 400 dock alone, I believe he only included $500,000 in dredging. Was that was that what you were asking? Yeah, yeah okay. but it could be higher. And then, you know, if we're going to go with the 125 to 200 slips, um, we're looking at a million and a half for dredging. We initially, as Greg mentioned, we were looking at about five and a half million dollars in dredging, and that was purely looking at the entire footprint of the marina boating area where the docks are currently, and then the, the exit to the river. Um, at a six foot depth, doing six foot deep, you know, all across the whole thing. And uh, that, was, that was provided by the Corps um, with their hydro, hydro, hydrological survey. So, um, you know, and then, uh, and then in factoring into all this too, we need to keep in mind that anything we do here and, and moving forward, we need to have a, the proper funding mechanism to maintain this for years going forward whether that's having an annual dredge plan and actually following, following through and doing that annual dredge plan. We don't know what that amount will be, but until you can get into a maintenance plan, we have to get the, you know, the, the entirety of the dredging done now so we can get into the maintenance cycle and we're, we're not there at all, obviously. Um, and then any other general maintenance associated with, with the marina. Is, is your uh, maintenance plan, is that considering um, leasing or, or 
hiring a dredge company to do the to do the dredging, or have we uh, considered or examined any of the costs related to maybe owning our own dredge and having an operator do it on a more regular basis? Yeah, has, speaking has for public works, though? that is not one thing that I don't think public works should be involved in dredging a marina. We just don't have the the knowledge. Even if we had the own equipment, there's a liability there. I, um, I think we're doing good sticking with streets. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, Mike, I would, Mike, I would point out. Uh, I think the city of Decatur in Central Illinois, um, they they attempted to do dredging internally, and they actually had a fatality, a fatal accident. Um, yeah, dredging is something best left to professionals who do this all day every day. Yeah, we we would have no knowledge on how to do that. Um, you know, we're doing good with with maintaining the marina and, and getting the boats pulled and keeping up with the docks and how, even with how bad a shape they are. And now, that's something that we can we can do, but that's that's really beyond our knowledge. So what you're saying is it's cost prohibitive yeah. at this point. Well, I'm not saying necessarily liability issue. Liability. Yeah, liability. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> liability is the biggest issue for us, and and just not having ever done it before, and we don't have enough staff. We have one person down there full time, and uh, you know we we wouldn't be able to dedicated resources to to come up with an annual plan and then get it done and you have to you have to get rid of that material and um, there's just a lot of involved with that also another grant opportunity is just to remind uh, people that uh, you know once again we've got a state legislation bill out there for the port district um, talk to legislators tonight uh, this afternoon uh, Mark Poulos and I did actually and they optimistic that that would get passed through the state uh, that does open opportunity uh, for infrastructure, a federal infrastructure bill uh, that uh, a number of, of cities and counties up and down the Mississippi have gotten funding, uh, some decent sized funding. Uh, for Quincy got some not too long ago, Savannah got some um, that, would, that would look pretty promising. So that, at this point, is moving forward. Mike, would you clarify for those that may be listening, the, the co chairs of uh, the co sponsors of this bill, just to show that there's a a bipartisan workability. Yes, Senator Mike uh, Helpin is the uh, sponsor, and uh, Senator Neil Anderson is a co-sponsor of it. On the Senate bill, is starting in the Senate, and uh, then we. Uh, so that's where. I did. And then uh, uh, Representative uh, Greg Johnson uh, would represent it on the uh, House side. We just, like I say, talked to all of them today. <laughs> And just one interesting point to two to find out, you know, in, in doing some research just for myself and trying to get caught up on where the city has been at in the past. I started working here in 2013, but I, I, I found council memos back to 2009, basically talking about this very same thing that we're talking about tonight and really what, what needed to be done, what could be done. And so, you know, it's a, it's a vicious cycle that has just, it's never been taken forward and actually and done. And so... You know, as, as, as explained tonight, it's beyond its useful life. We do have hazards there and liabilities that need to be addressed one way or another. And so we, any direction we can get and, and that we can move forward on is, is better and will ultimately save us money in the, in the future by eliminating some liabilities. Uh, excuse me, Mayor. Yes, go ahead. A question for Bartels or Todd. How does the city perform its due diligence on the pro forma that's been presented here this evening? Uh, no offense, of course, to the presenters, but we are talking about potentially taking on a lot of financial risk on a pro forma that that was just presented to us. Uh, you know, if we were a bank, I imagine we'd be doing some due diligence on the numbers uh, feasibility study, market demand study to see if the numbers are accurate. Do we have a plan to double check the pro forma? Uh, and I'll just say that I'm opposed to closing it. I'm opposed to selling it. Uh, I'm open to either self-performing or partnering with a private developer. Um, but I think whether we self-perform or partner with a private developer, we need to double check the pro forma first. We need to do our due diligence. So has there been any thought on staff on after this doing a due diligence uh, on the numbers presented tonight? Because if we if we do and they come, they come back and say, yep, looks feasible, looks good, then you have a thumbs up from me to do 
either. Um, us help perform or partner. Yeah. Isn't this isn't this why we went through this process? Are, are we just are like I feel like we're proofreading now, and I know it's a time it's kind of a time sensitive thing here to get moving on this, and how long is that going to take? And yeah. I don't know. I feel like we're just going around a circle again. I think, I think what I was going to say is once we have a scope defined. Um, and we can actually truly evaluate the true poor form of that we're going to do, then that, that would be the time. And we, we do have F3 currently managing the marina now for the past five years. They've managed marinas all around the country as well. We would certainly have them involved in, in the review. Um, and then we could look at an, an, an additional independent um, review of, of our plan. Um, that would be it. I don't know, Todd, if you want to add anything yeah. additional. I was going to offer that. I think, I think if you were contemplating borrowing $10 million to invest in your marina, you'd probably want to have a, a higher level of analysis done on the market demand. Uh, initially, tonight, I think the decision is more focused on the 400 dock. Do you want staff? I don't think that's the decision. I think it's all three of the options presented. I mean, you're the ones presenting the 400. I think yeah. we could give direction on a smaller 125 as far as that goes, couldn't we? Well, just because of the timeliness of the 400 dock, yeah. Well, I understand, but we can't do that until the dredging is done. So regardless, I mean, we say 400 now, we could also do the 125. As a yeah, the decision on 400 dock you really need to make is proceed with the engineering. If you don't, if you don't do that very quickly, you're going to lose the opportunity to take advantage of that FEMA grant money. Well, that's what I'm saying. So when do we get into this? And then we're going to now go through another whole, like a, I don't know go through this all again with proofreading, so to speak. And I, my own opinion is I think we need the dredging has to happen first. I mean, we got to get that done, right, obviously. But you need to do the engineering to do but, dredging. It's correct. But the issue is the definition of dredging. Dredging just what 400 dock is or dredging uh, um, half the marina? Well, we That's the difference the, well, between that. We can do the dredging for the 125 slip size for a million. We've set aside a million dollars already of of funding towards the marina and that gives us a year to complete some other funding to pay for the city match for the FEMA if we have a year extension. Just in the, yeah, but I think the, the, the challenge is the income that could be generated by redoing other docks is what pays for the dredging, right? It's kind of, you got to all do this together. And the thing about the dredging is it's an unknown what it's going to cost until you do the engineering and do some testing of the soil to determine if it's contaminated or not. That's why I say the immediate decision is move forward with the engineering, find out the scope of the work, find out the estimated cost of the work, and then you can make decisions right. going forward from yes. there. That, that's really yes. okay. Judith, I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying. Right. I'm just saying the engineering is key to, that's fine. to moving forward with anything. Uh, initially, when we submitted ARPA requests for you know, for funding for the departments. My ARPA request for the marina was three and a half million dollars. And I, I, in my, you know, description, I put that that was the bare minimum of what I felt was needed to keep the marina moving forward in a positive fashion, or at least bring it up to state current standards. And so, you know, we did, we did get a million, but so, we're, you know, I'm thinking at least three and a half million dollars is what we're probably looking at. Um, but you're close to that with the ARPA and the FEMA dollars, right? You are, depending on what scope of work we do, you know. Um, again, it's highly, highly, um, decide, without knowing what dredging needs done, I mean, I could change the cost in a hurry. But, I mean, it's safe to say that that entire area needs, needs dredged. Yes. Judith, you had something to say. Thank you. We only have a million dollars of our own money to use as either match for the FEMA grant. And that's estimated the match at 725,000, so that leaves you another 200 and some thousand dollars uh, remaining after you do the match for the FEMA. Okay, so what is that, 725,000, okay. So, how much dredging would that get in engineering? Yeah, you probably would get the engineering done and the survey. And, and Greg or Nick, you can please weigh yeah. in because you're you're more knowledgeable than I could ever be on, yeah. on that part. I think you're, you're spot on. The, the real question here in terms of 
I would view the feasibility we're sharing with you tonight as kind of the first layer of feasibility. It makes it clearly makes sense to move forward with the renovation. And so the next step in that sort of due diligence process is to advance the engineering so we can tighten up those construction numbers significantly. Um, so that is what we'd recommend is, is we want to look at the dredging. We want to look at the sedimentation sampling to understand what those disposal costs would be. And then what we would do then is move into, okay, now we're going to advance the design to the point where we can be much more confident in the construction costs. On the revenue side, I'm quite confident on those rates that I prepared with you because that's what your market is charging right now. So I would think if we can give you much more detailed information on the costs, F3 would certainly be competent to provide an independent analysis of the of the revenue side um, to help support that. But you're spot on uh, the gentleman who recommended further due diligence. The process next is the engineering. So. And we would do much of that engineering through the through the 400 doc process. We would we, by by doing what needs to be done to get 400 doc resolved. We would expand the engineering process to look at the dredging for the whole project and answer those questions as well. So, how much would you anticipate that engineering costing? Yeah. Well, so just to do the design work. Pete, your question, please. Yeah. How ballpark? How much do you anticipate that engineering costing? So we already have a proposal to do the 400 dot, correct, Nick? Yeah, that was 187,000. Yeah, but I think that includes a lot more stuff like foundation design for the piles and the bot much other stuff related to electrical work as well. I'd have to double check, but usually for that upfront engineering for, for dredging, you're talking about getting a bathymetry survey, doing some testing so that gets requires an offshore rig to grab actual soil samples. Um, we might have that embedded as a task item for that in that proposal. I'm sure it's in there somewhere. Um, but I, you know, I guess we, I mean, I'd like to look back and, and see exactly and define if we're looking at just the 400, what that, what those tasks items might cost. But for dredging and not to interrupt Nick, but we can't look at just the 400 dock because we have boaters right. in there now that need to get out of their slips that we want to remain. And that can't that can't yes. do that. So we have to we have to do additional dredging. That that's outside of the 400 doc footprint. Right. Yeah. So we would need yeah. to quantify those areas so that we can get soil samples and bathymetry to properly figure out what exactly material is there, so that we could then go to the permitting folks and say, here's the materials we encountered. You know, what is the dredging process going to look like for construction? How are we going to dewater that sort of stuff as well? And those. Yeah, we would do the. Oh, go, go ahead. Sorry. Slips Judith, are go viable ahead. slips, the ones that we'd also have to dredge so they can get out. Are they viable slips or are they part of the ones that are like should just be torn down? No. Yeah. So the, the ones closer to the, the riverside would be the area we'd want to focus on. The they, ones that are covered currently. The ones three, further it's 300, to this. It's 300 dock, which are viable slips uh, it, to, by the lift well, what they're talking about lifting. Uh, the lift well it goes right down uh, uh, one side of what they call 300 dock and not the wooden ones that you see along the shoreline that are pretty well destroyed those are not there it goes by that but that's not to make those viable so that yeah we could spend the million dollars which is all we really have at this point for the engineering costs and maybe the dredging and may, that even may go over that amount am i you could spend the million dollars just in dredging alone without any engineering. So I still don't understand how we're supposed to pay for this. And when I look at selling bonds to invest to do this marina, I'm like, okay, we, we, we have a history where we've done that on other projects. We thought, oh, we're gonna pay off. And now we can't even pay principal on those bonds. So I have grave concerns about, I'm a fiscal conservative, about selling bonds to do this going beyond what you know the minimum is you want to talk about self-funding a little bit or not or yeah I, I think you know he the, the larger proposal the nine million dollar proposal uh, is is a is he suggested we do it in phases so the first logical phase is the 400 doc correct in the yes. engineering to actually build the 400 doc is, is part of the FEMA grant it eligible. Is. It would be yeah. yes. So the thing that's not FEMA grant eligible is to, is the dredging work. So the engineering and the dredging work related to that, 
uh, wouldn't wouldn't be eligible under under that grant. Um, so, as you identified, there's a portion of the uh, ARPA funds that aren't going to be expended that could go towards that. The unknown is how much more than that will the dredging cost? Well, if it's five hundred thousand, you're not too far off. If it's more than that, you know you're going to add that on top of the project. I, I wouldn't suggest in order to get the 400 doc oh, done that you would no, need I, to issue bonds. It's probably not going to be no, that large no, no. of an amount of money. You could <laughs> loan yourself the money, uh, perhaps, if there's a gap in order to recover it. That would be one and strategy. Anybody no. loan ourselves the money. To yeah, cover it's the not gap. uncommon for cities to, when you have a fund that's an enterprise fund, to, to loan yourself money uh, to do the project. I mean, you could give yourself the money and not return it, not receive it back. But, but that gives us an opportunity yeah. to apply for some of these other grants to help to right. repay. Yeah. Like, if we're yeah. loaning ourselves money, we could repay ourselves when these grants, yeah. if we apply for these grants and they're successful. And then we have the potential of, like uh, the mayor was speaking about, the, the port, you know, if that, if that were to come through. So I think there's other options. And since this is getting extended out an extra year anyway, that does buy us a little time. If we do the dredging. If we do, yeah. yes. Yeah. So what I'm, what I'm looking at here on the, the slide for the ownership of the 400 dock replacement, it looks like we probably have the money to do the 400 dock replacement with that little bit of dredging. If you look at the slips, there's 78 of them. Correct. So if we were to do a smaller size marina just to start with 125 slips, we're almost there. I mean, yeah, we're no. only 50, 60 boats away from that. So, I mean, to me, if you do the 400 dock replacement, spend extra money, how, you know, however we want to fund that, to do the full dredging that we need to for all the docks for a smaller marina, you get the dredging done, you get the 400 dock done, gives you 78 slips that you can go ahead <clears throat> and rent out. The 300 dock is still viable. You've got the slips there. I mean, yeah, you are gonna lose some, but I mean, to be honest with you right now, you're close to that smaller marina size of 125 slips. And yeah, I realize you're gonna have to do extra electrical and some of that other stuff, but you know, I just kind of feel like, you know, I mean, I'm for, the marina, I, I think it's a great amenity to the city. I know there's some people who say it's not gonna pay for itself, it's not gonna fund itself, but you know what? The parks don't either. And this at least has an opportunity to be a revenue generator to help fund some stuff back, especially if you did like a, a bond, a revenue bond thing. It also will bring people into the community and the more we can develop things around there, the more attract people you're gonna attract, the more people you can keep. And I think the ultimate goal is you can't grow Rock Island unless you have people coming into Rock Island. So to me, I'm sorry, it's a no-brainer to go ahead and keep the marina. Now, not at the level we have it now, but I would say you have my full support to do the 400 dock replacement, to look at 125 slip marina to just start with and continue to build on it as we, th we see interest, because like you said, there is a deficit of slips on the river. It would be foolish of us to have an amenity such as Sunset as a marina on the river, which that is so many people's pastime in the summer. I mean, if you look out there on the river, it's packed with boats. I mean, it is packed mm -hmm. and, and they're somewhere. They're not sitting in everybody's garage. And then you look at the amount of people who are kayaking and paddle boarding and canoeing and the river is used. It is a great summer entertainment thing. And for us to turn our backs on something like that and close our eyes and stick our head in the sand because we're afraid is, is quite frankly, fiscally foolish. So do we have, we need to send, uh, send them away with the specific scope and everything. I have one more question. So how many viable slips are there on the 300 dock? I don't have that information in front of me. And they're not ADA and everything else electrical. So to say they're viable, but they are, it, it, they are, it is something that could be phased in and they could be used for a while. Uh, that is for sure. Just like same as 500 is relatively new or newer, uh, unlike 200 and, uh, and some others, 600, 700, those are in bad shape. Well, that's the, um, so but, uh, go ahead. No, I, and I don't mean to sound like an expert. I just happen to be down there a lot. Uh, so <laughs> I can tell you I'm absolutely not foreclosing or selling it 
in any way, shape, or form. Um, Horrible ideas. I don't know if it does. Okay. I mean, I, I, those aren't even viable options, in my opinion. I think we have something that we can turn around. I think down the line, we can market things, kayaking, paddle boarding, stuff like that, that, you know, that is new things that are coming up that weren't 30, 35 years ago. So if we could take that even as a revenue stream down the line, um, you know, I, so you're okay doing this in the scope I, of a, mini, a, a shrunk down marina? Scope of that engineering? At, at least, yeah. Okay. I mean, and, and wait on the port district, you know? Okay. Yeah. Mark? I'm Absolutely. for the 125 number myself to start with and then build on as. I think that's demand. where they yes, are. Yes, I think we're okay. all in it. Yeah. yeah. I, I think it's fiscally responsible for us to move forward with this. Okay. The problem is, is it's been kicked down the road that's right. so many times that's why we're, we're that now it. we're standing up here and. We have to do something about it, and that's a problem. And you know, it sucks, but gotta do what you gotta do, right? Greg and, and Nick, um, you know, we're talking about possibly 125 slip solution, or you know, however it works out. How, how long would it take for? Are you, are you thinking like in 30 days I could come back to council with a, a contract or proposal for engineering and design for whatever scope that we identify? Uh, would, would that be enough time? We could have that to you by the end of the week. Okay. When, one question: What what's the shutdown time for this for the 2023 season? If we move forward with this, what how is that going to affect the operations down there? It's it's that as far as that goes, it's it's all dependent on the on the water level at this point. We we would not be able to get the dredging completed. We we may be lucky to even get the engineering done for this year for dredging. Correct me if I'm wrong. It's permitting more than anything. Um, the engineering is relatively straightforward. The time-consuming bits would be getting the testing done. That's probably, what, Nick, three to five weeks turnaround from the labs. And then the permit process, you know, can be... What the permitting agencies want to see is a comprehensive the vision of the whole thing, even if you're only going to build parts of it. So that's what we would try to get to. Um, so this would be looking at you know, realistically dredging in the fall. I will tell you this, whenever we do a marina renovation, um, we work, I mean, all of us in, you know, in the north of the U.S., we have about 100 days of boating <laughs> from, you know, Memorial Day to Labor Day. Uh, we work very, very hard to make sure that the marina is fully open in those time periods, and we do all the construction work and anything that's going to interrupt boating activities outside of that window uh, as much as humanly possible, and we're, we're, we've been pretty successful at that over the years. And, and I'll just Thank add you. one point only because I'm currently doing this for a different dredge project in Fox in Fox Lake. The, the timelines for the permits is highly dependent upon what material you pull out of the ground and what you're going to do with that end source. So if the city has flexibility of using that source and putting it thin spreading it at a, at a green space or doing something with that material, that makes the permitting process faster because Illinois EPA is most concerned about what we're pulling out of the water and where is it going to go. And so it's very difficult to quantify how long it takes to get a permit just because unless you have those answers, it, Illinois EPA is not going to, you know, disclose a lot of that. And that that process can take easily six months at a minimum upwards of, you know, eight to 12 at worst. So could you fill in the other side with it on the ball diamond, the old ball diamond side and there. build that up? Yep. Is that? Yeah, I don't know without without look, doing the research. Without and, knowing, yeah, without knowing so without knowing what the chemical nature of the material is, it's very difficult to, to say. You got that possibility. You got the New Riverstone property that was, that was thick, acquired I didn't with the where the ball diamond there, was right? there in thirty first or eighteenth uh, yeah. Avenue. So we got a couple of possibilities depending on what the material is when we discover what type of materials under there. We can use it for we, potholes. Yes, there you go. <laughs> we do need to, we do need to, I don't want to rush this. I want to make sure that we I've give been, enough time until we finally get in there, but we do have another presentation. So they, they said by the end of the week, and I, I, I appreciate the speediness, but we, we would need a, a good 30 days to bring it back, a proper <laughs> review, a proper, you know, uh, discussing okay. with, with other artists. March 27th other council meeting. What's that? March 27th council meeting. Yeah, we could, we could certainly have that. We'll, we'll then. plan on bringing back the uh, scope of work for the engineering at uh, no later than the March 27th. And maybe we could do that in, in a study session again ahead of time on, on kind of showing you the scope of work that's proposed. Awesome. Okay. All right. Thank you. Work for engineering for just the dredging, the dredging, the 400 for, dock? For, or for the everything. Dredging? I think it's everything. Yeah. 
Because you have to have every, a plan for everything before you can ask for. So it'd be, it'd be for the 125 approximately slip side or slip count, um, the dredging associated with that, any decommissioning that we want to see on the, the older docks to the, the south, and, um, and then obviously the electrical upgrades to the docks that we want to have remain. Have you looked at any of those plastic injection molding docks like they do? They make them in Princeton. Big docks. Did you look at any of those in the cost? That, that, yeah, that type of construction typically isn't compatible with covered roof systems. Those tend to be more of a, of a smaller boat type system. Um, so that some of the, some of the molding, rotomolded molded plastics for the, uh, for the flotation might work that way, but the, the, Fully injection molded um, kind of modular dock systems wouldn't work with a, a roof system. Okay. Did Thank I you very much. Something? Dylan, did you have something to say? Just a quick question. Did I miss something where we decided to go with the 125 option over the 200? Uh, no, I think I, I brought up the 125 just to start small to get things rolling. We, we can always, we can always go beyond that, but it's a starting point and and, Probably and more feasible at this Part point. of the thing, I don't mean to take more time, but if we go with the 125 option, we need to see how many slips we currently are able to remain right. and how many boaters are going to be displaced because that, that has a lot of that impact. That number can fluctuate, decision. but at least let's see where it's at with mm -hmm. that, and we can go from there. But we've got to have a starting point. And somewhere. those are the things that we need to have that time to and think can, about. That number can be expanded somewhat if needed. But mm -hmm. um, I know we're trying to close out, but I was, uh, Greg, Nick, thanks for the great job you guys did. Uh, good presentation. and. Uh, very knowledgeable and Mike thanks for all the work you guys are doing as well so. thank, thank you. you very much thank you great progress See you soon. chief you're up next you get five minutes no <laughs> 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 now you get a little more than that uh, thank you council I just wanted to give the uh, council an overview of the uh, automated lot, uh, license plate reader system that uh, we're recommending to council for approval later tonight. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time getting into this. I will tell you that uh, the system that we're lo are looking for approval tonight is one that's already in place and operation in Silvis, East Moline, Milan. Uh, County is looking to be adding it also. So we would be one of the biggest to add it on. But what's nice about this is it's a system that's up and running. Uh, it's beyond just the Quad Cities, it's uh, throughout the region. But um, we've also been utilizing it, our criminal investigation division, uh, last year I signed into a, uh, it's a, there was no cost involved, but it allows us access to the system. Our criminal investigation's been using it in, in turning out some uh, useful results. And that's without even having our cameras in our city. And once we can do that, um, I anticipate that uh, this will be very beneficial. So um, also, uh, I'm lucky to have uh, State's Attorney Dora Villarreal here tonight. Uh, she's here in support, but she's also here to available to answer any questions if you have any regarding that aspect of this. Uh, but I'm going to turn this over to Hector uh, with uh, Flock Safety. I see him up there. And Hector, if you can share your screen for the slides, hey, Hector, that'd be here great. looking like, what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> Hector <Yeah>. Solomon. <laughs> Hector Solomon, good uh, evening uh, to you all. Uh, that is the person that popped up on your screen. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen as the chief... Um, said uh, perfect can you all see um a presentation in front of you all yes yes great so um as the chief said uh, my name is hector Soliman. i am a community engagement manager with flock safety i wanted to start off by talking a little bit about flock and who we are, are as a company um, we are a Georgia-based company, uh, and we were founded when our CEO and his neighbors were victims of multiple crimes in their neighborhood, um, car burglaries, houses getting bro broken into, among other things. As many of you all have, uh, they also had uh, ring camera footage, tons of uh, camera footage, and they presented this to their local law enforcement. Uh, but what they found out is that many times this was not enough to actually solve these crimes. What their police departments let them know is that a license plate would have been that good first uh, clue or piece of evidence that could have actually helped solve this uh, these crimes. So our CEO um, set out to do some research and see, well, you know, license plate readers have been around for a long time. Um, why can't, don't communities uh, have 
them more available. And what he found out is that, you know, cameras traditionally, LPR cameras were tens of thousands of dollars. Cities uh, would have to purchase them directly. And just like when you purchase an iPhone in the next year, uh, they may be obsolete. So he started off by creating a, a, a software as a service type of model uh, where his neighborhood uh, could purchase cameras that would connect to the police department. Um, but they're the same level uh, of, of accuracy and type of equipment that police needed. And so since then, we've expanded to over 1,400 communities within the United States. Um, so really having that private partnership, uh, private public partnership, but also because it was started off for neighborhoods, making sure that privacy is at the center of everything that we do. So I kind of went over why flock safety a little bit already. You know, they found out that police had limited resources, right? You know, there's tons of red Hondas in the city, but it, so if you have that footage, but there's no license plate or anything for the police to go off of, it's really hard for them to solve the crime. So creating the opportunity is to create a, a force multiplier and capture and distribute that objective evidence to the right users while having a portion of our business really be uh, around engaging community, right? And, and ensuring that they can assist as well. So I've kind of talked a little bit about the cameras in general, ALPR, what does that mean? Automatic license plate readers, but how does this actually work? So top right hand corner, this is actual footage that your police will be able to pull up uh, in their investigations. As you can see, it is the back of a vehicle um, there is no people, there's no facial recognition, and there's no traffic enforcement. What the police can do is search by make, color, among other filters, to find a vehicle that matches the description of what they're looking for. As I already mentioned, there's no personal identifiable information within Flock. Our standard retention policy is 30 days. And why is that important? It's obviously really important to also balance privacy and what this does is that it allows folks, even if they're on vacation for a couple of weeks, let's say two weeks, to report a crime, uh, but it's not long-term retention of data, right? So police will be able to go in within that first month and, and investigate uh, crimes. But after that, all of the data is hard deleted. There's three aspects to this technology. It's proactive in that your police department will be receiving alerts in their vehicles within 20 seconds, anytime that a stolen vehicle, among other uh, uh, wanted vehicle reasons, is, is identified within your city. It's also investigated, right? So as I said in the, in the previous story, uh, when we were founded, you know, they had a ton of evidence. Um, and so using these cameras, they would have been able to go in and search for those vehicles and start that investigation. Something else that's widely known in law enforcement is that many times as clearance rates increase, crime rates decrease. And what does that mean? Well, typically in any month, let's say you have 10 burglaries in your city. That doesn't mean that there's 10 different individuals committing those crimes. There may be one or two. And if you are able to catch, catch them on that first or second try, you're potentially deterring uh, you know, those additional eight crimes. This also serves as a deterrent. Over one, uh, I think almost 200 cities in, in Illinois already have our cameras. Uh, and so this would add your city um, to that list and make sure that folks know you also are protected. Now, how does Flock mitigate for risk? Unlike uh, traditional uh, vendors, uh, all of the footage is owned by the city and it will never be sold or shared by Flock. Uh, that means that only your department can share that within the system for legal law enforcement purposes. This takes out the human bias out of crime solving, right? So now your police officers don't have to go off on a hunch as, hey, this vehicle, one that I wanna stop, we're now providing them with objective data. This is a vehicle that's done something that's objectively illegal, it's a stolen vehicle that's entered your community. Where all of the data is stored in AWS government cloud, it's end-to-end -end encrypted, uh, which is the highest level of, of uh, Act of privacy that's out there. This is the same type of servers used by the FBI and CIA. All of these servers are um, completely within the United States. A search reason is required and there's an audit trail. Uh, what's important here, which I believe might be in your packet, is that the, the police's policy will require that that search reason be a case number or a reference number. That's something that you can only get in an ongoing investigation or an active investigation, let's just say. I mentioned earlier that there's no personal identifiable information within Flock. Uh, which means that, you know, six months down the line, this can't be used for traffic enforcement. There's no button that can be turned on one day where all of a sudden your police will be stopping people for registration or light, uh, or red light uh, uh, violations, et cetera, right? This is for solving crime. 
and it actually solves and prevents crime. As I mentioned, I think we're at exactly 196 um, police departments in Illinois. This is just a quick list uh, for your reference but all of the cities in your area are uh, in the process of ad ad adopting flock uh, for the most part and then i also wanted to just highlight some uh soft stories this one is out of shorewood um it's a silver alert which means that this person the 70 year old um shorewood man he went missing uh the shorewood police force used the flock safety license plate readers database for the chicago uh, suburban region right so the region around chicago they noticed that his vehicle was uh in posing um, Posen police then, uh, you, you know, saw that the vehicle or put a vehicle in a hot list uh, that can be seen by eight ne uh, nearby police departments. Uh, and then what they noticed is that, you know, he, this person had dementia, he was having some health issues. So they were able to find him, find that vehicle by, five, by 515. So just a little bit over an hour. So really important to know in these type of cases, you know, uh, it's really important. Uh, time is of the essence, right? And having that network effect is extremely important. I also wanted to showcase Bloomington, Illinois uh, results. It's a no brainer that this will be helpful for stolen vehicles. But what's really interesting here to note is that this was used for so many different types of crimes to, to solve those different crimes, right? So um, domestic abduction, armed robbery, uh, such attempted murder, business burglaries, four stolen vehicles, aggravated DUI, three different suicidal subject calls. So really a lot of different use cases uh, for this technology. I also want to highlight uh, this smash and grab out of San Bruno, California. This made national news um, because they attempted to rob this jewelry store, but there was armed security there. Uh, when they saw that there was armed security, he was able to shoo them away. Uh, so, you know, they left the scene. But what the police department there believed is that they would return. That police department, San Bruno, is a flock customer. So what they did is that they put a hot list on that vehicle. And as soon as they did return, and attempt to escalate the level of, of violence, right? Now they were ready to, you know, for an armed security guard. As soon as they returned into that shopping center, San Bruno police was able to stop them, therefore preventing that crime from happening and escalating in, in violence. And then I wanted to end uh, with this story out of Chambly, Georgia. It's a stranger on stranger abduction, which means that this uh, woman you see here had no idea uh, uh, what was going to happen that day or who these people were that came up to her armed and masked, fought her and took her child away. All she had was a description of the vehicle, not even a license plate. She was able to provide that to the police department in Chamley. They quickly went into flock, found a suspect vehicle, put out an alert and made a felony stop and arrest in Alabama. So one stayed over and reunite and, and, and made that felony stop and reunited the baby with their mother by 6 p.m. These are very rare cases. This is not something that happens every day. But what's important here is that, again, time is of the essence. Um, and luckily, this baby will never remember that day. Those folks that did that, they intended to raise a child on their own, but they're now locked up uh, behind bars um, after that crime. So, you know, really grateful that this technology is around in that area. I know I did a lot of talking at you all. My goal was really just to uh, provide you information on us as a company, how we're solving crime in your area, um, and then how uh, ethics is baked into everything that we do, but would love to answer any specific questions that you have. And then also uh, really quickly, just do want to remind you the cameras are infrastructure free. Uh, these are just some of the different setups and by infrastructure free, I mean, we set them up. Um, they are solar powered and, and connected to the internet via the cellular network. And now thing. with that, any questions? Yep, thank you. Any questions? I do have a couple. Um, are these, is this data, are these foyable? Are these foyable stuff, or how is that going to work if somebody were to need that in a, yeah. in a like attorneys, can they afford, can, is it foyable stuff? That's an excellent question. So um, I am not your legal counsel. I'm also not an attorney in general. But what I can tell you is uh, that the data that's contained within Flock. Uh, in order to access it, your police department needs to have a case number or a reference number, right? So it's part of an ongoing investigation. What our legal department has seen and what we have seen other department uh, or other cities uh, kind of decide here is that this is all information that's part of an ongoing investigation, right? And so once they access that information, it is um, entered into an evidence system and it follows that uh, type of um, kind of process. 
uh, for FOIA request purposes. Um, so, uh, you know, there's kind of that that distinction there that there's no data that's a, that that the police are just holding. Uh, they only are holding the data that's part of an investigation. I, I can answer a little bit of that also, and I, if Hector wants to jump in or any Dave. What I've my experience is as long as it's not a document that we possess. In other words, this is a database. In order, if someone said, "Hey, I want to know how many times my license plate," well, I'd have to do a search to find out. So that in and of itself would not be foiable because I'd have to search a database to find it and create this record. Okay. So I would say that would be my first thought looking at this. It is, I don't know if Dave wants to add anything more to that, but I think that the real answer is it depends on what the AG decides in the future. I'm guessing there's not an opinion right now, but somebody's going to say, hey, I don't like my daughter dating that guy. Let's see if his car has been in the neighborhood. That's going to happen sooner or later. You know it is. And uh, so then the AG is going to say, well, how do I feel today? And they're going to stick their, uh, put their finger up in the air and see which way the wind's blowing. And they're going to come up with some arbitrary decision and say, yeah, it's part of an ongoing investigation. Or as you've seen, ones that I think are really ongoing investigations. And they go, yeah, but it doesn't affect the ongoing investigation. So we're going to let them have it anyway. It's going to, I'm not saying it's not a reason to not do it. I'm just saying you be aware it's going to be a mess. It's going to be a mess for sure. And so you should probably contact one of these particular uh, municipalities and say, hey, has this come up? Because as you know as well as I do, those opinions, you know, pick it, pick it, pick it out of the hat. You know, things that seem to be the same, they decide differently, in my personal opinion. Chief, I have a couple of yeah, questions. Yeah, that's it. We got, yeah, we got to watch the time. Yep. I, can I, just one more, Mark, two more. Well, he was going to respond. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You're going to respond. Well, the, the only additional piece of context that I was going to add is um, there is a limited retention, right? And so the data is deleted on a 30-day rolling basis. That also assists with, with any of those type of questions, right? There may be no record to be, create, be created as well. So just adding um, that, that additional piece of context. Well, I'm just saying if you're, I'm looking at it from a, a legal aspect, say you're a, an attorney and you're going to want to get that and that's the information is going to be gone after 30 days or? Mm -hmm. Correct. Totally. That seems kind of weird. Um, my second question, a couple questions real quick. I know we're in a hurry. Now, are you expecting, is this going to create a added burden to RICOM or are you going to need to hire a different person? Because it seems like there's a lot going on and someone's monitoring these. I don't, I guess I don't know. How. No, we, we've already had a pilot program for uh, LPR already. We've done this before. We've had three licenses that were in place. And what it does, it sends an alert on a dashboard just simply says, hey, this vehicle is at this location. It comes up as a stolen vehicle. Um, and that also goes directly to the squad cars, too. The officers will have it up in their squad cars. So there's not one pers uh, particular person that's going to be responsible for it. Last question. Is this map that you're providing on this, is this uh, projected locations? Is that what all this? Those yeah. are the fixed locations for each of those cameras, 21 cameras around the city. Okay. Well, I just noticed I have nothing out in southwest Rock Island along the that that is correct, but let me just say one thing about that. Milan is adding cameras out there, and we semi-circle Milan. So um, they have some in place already. Uh, West 20th Avenue, there's one. There's also one on 1st Avenue. Uh, in conversations with the chief there, they're looking at putting one on 78th Avenue or their West 10th, which is next to their Casey's, I believe, is where they're looking, which if we have a vehicle that's traveling either direction, they're going to be going to either Milan or Rock Island there. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mark, did you have a question? Real quick. Uh, are, are these... But photos, uh, image captures, are they going to be considered evidence then uh, if a vehicle is in, a, is in a location at the time of a alleged violation? They could be, but remember, this is just, these cameras, they're running, they're, they're not going to, there's nothing to grab until we look for it. Right. So if we find a vehicle that we're in, we believe is involved in a crime, what we do is we pull that information off, and now it's entered into the actual case file. Otherwise, it's just data hanging out there. So, I mean, there, there's no issues with fry hearings or anything like that that, that we would have to be concerned We would have with. to know it exists in the first place. And again, either it's an alert because it's already entered into NCIC or Leeds as a stolen vehicle or some other type of wanted vehicle, or it's a vehicle of interest to us for an investigation and we pull it out. Yeah, but what I was talking about would, and this is more for our state's attorney, uh, would, there, would, would there be an issue with a fry, would there be a, a request for a fry hearing on on this kind of technology, or has that, has that already been determined? Um, there have been some FRI <coughs> hearings in other counties. Cook County doesn't have this particular system. They have a different brand. There have been some on that based on reliability. Um, but 
to be honest, I'm a big proponent of more surveillance simply because our judges, our juries, they are expecting more evidence. It, it's not enough anymore to just have a witness statement, um, not to mention that we have less cooperating witnesses than we have in the past. So we need actual tangible evidence, and maybe this isn't exactly going to tell us who did what, but it could actually give you leads when we don't have any other leads. Um, and also just on the FOIA, I, I do agree that some of the FOIAs may be some uncharted territory that we don't know how that could look, but we also have retention periods for all of the body-worn camera and the squad cameras as well. So those also delete too, because there's only so many thousands of terabytes that our agencies can handle. So that it, that's the way it is by law. We have certain types of um, evidence that we have to retain for a certain amount of time. So if there are FOIAs looking for something completely random and unrelated to an investigation, and we don't have it, that, that is our answer. And, and I think that uh, two things. One is I, I agree with you, uh, and I, I guess when I think, that, I think Hector not our Hector, but this Hector. Um, <laughs> he said that, uh, I thought I heard him say that this is the property of the city, and I guess it depends on when it becomes the property of the city, because there is an exception for, is it a database that is accessible to law enforcement, as opposed to it's my property, but my what I thought I heard, and maybe I misheard, was that this is our property, and I think there's a big distinction between those two things. I think what Hector, Hector, you can correct me if I'm wrong, what I think by he meant by that was, they're not gonna sell this to a third party. Okay. So, you know, there's other companies that are privately owned that do this license plate recognition, and they sell that data for, per, for other reasons, uh, insurance okay. companies, things like that. This is not, and this, correct me if I'm wrong, is that correct, Hector? Correct. So only that, we cannot sell that data, we cannot share that data, only you can, um, you know, share that data within the system. Uh, so so, so that's, that's kind of what we mean by that. You, you I, own the data. I think that that would go a long ways toward the database exception. You know, once again, there's no way to know for sure. And I do think that some of the examples they've given, I'm sure that uh, with the number of cross city pursuits and so so forth, that's important too. So. Okay, I just have one quick question for the chief. <laughs> so you said there's cameras in Milan, and who else has these cameras? Uh, Silvis in East Moline. And I talked to the sheriff this morning, and he has confirmed that he is also working towards adding them strategically in different areas of the county for them. With and this brand, there are, this, Bettendorf's got one, but different yeah. brands. Right. Yeah, I, there's two predominant companies out there, and Hector, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's uh, Flock and Vigilant. And Vigilant's used by the state. The different, main thing with Vigilant is two different platforms. Uh, Flock is a subscription base, Vigilant's more of a hardware base. But the other thing is, is the reason that uh, Vigilant is used is because theirs is set up for more high speed. So when you're having cars traveling 75, 80 miles an hour, those cameras are designed more for that. Or Flock is more of the inside of the cities, the more, you know, 55, 45, things like that. Okay. Hate to cut everybody off, but we get to go. Motion to adjourn. Turn. <laughs> is there a second? Oh, please. All the person Swanson. Aye. Parker. Aye. Poulos. Aye. Healy. Aye. Hurt? Aye.